outlined against the blue-gray October sky, the four horsemen rode again. In dramatic lore, their names are famine, pestilence, destruction, and death. These are only aliases. Their real names are Stuldrer, Miller, Crowley, and Leyden. They formed the crest of the South Bend Cyclone, before which another fighting army team was swept over the precipice at the polo grounds this afternoon as 55,000 spectators peered down upon the bewildering panorama spread out upon the green plain below. This is Peter Hallen, and we're with the four horsemen here, Notre Dame. And um, Gus, do I'm you Gus, want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Gus Silke, I, uh, class of 1980, Notre Dame, studied theology. Okay, I'm uh, class of, uh, started in 70 when they had uh, no girls, and um, I dropped out a little bit and I ended up with the class of 78 with a degree in German. I'm a 77 graduate, came back for my first reunion, international relations. 79, government. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's uh, go right to the four horsemen because that's the theme. And obviously the fellow that wrote that is referring to Revelation 6, okay? And he's, in my mind, he's kind of, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's a little sacrilegious in my mind, okay? Uh, uh, there's a lot of Hollywood everywhere you go, okay? But this is getting serious because the, before I read the Revelations there, uh, the Russian top official, this just came out, uh, June 4th, today's June 5th, it says, top Russian official warns, horsemen of the apocalypse are already on their way. And he goes on and says, um, <clears throat> he's talking about if any weapons that we are putting in Ukraine, if they go into Russia, if we, if we target Russia from there, it, it's over. And he says, the, uh, um, he's the former prime minister and former president of Russia, went on to a um, ominously say the horsemen of the apocalypse are already on their way and all hope now is with lord god almighty okay so this is uh this is moving past hollywood into into actual reality and as chris was saying uh 40 percent of the russians they have their bunkers okay they're practicing they've been practicing getting down in their bunkers and we sit here uh like like a bunch of I don't even want to say it. Okay. But here's what it says in the book of Revelation regarding the, the four horsemen. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And, behold, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beast of the earth. 
So when that Russian official is citing this, and he says, the, you know, the horsemen of the apocalypse are on their way, and our only hope is in Lord God Almighty, some people think this is getting serious, okay? And it's not just Hollywood, and it's not just um, entertainment, which where Americans mostly are still in entertainment mode, wouldn't you say? Mm hmm I mean, it seems, yeah. So... How do how do how do we address now, Chris? Your international studies, mm -hmm. okay. okay. Dave, you were uh, government, <clears throat> okay. Government, okay. And I think that we have to look at <laughs> you have to look at the 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 radicalism of the American experiment, which uh, Fletcher. I, I I trust Fletcher. He was he, the guy was. Right there in 1775 and 76, writing books challenging the premises of the experiment, and um, he's he's arguing with uh, Dr. P uh, Price that it was Price, Price and Evans, the two great theologians from London and P Bristol, and Bristol was the second largest city in Britain, and uh, he, he 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 summarizes it, and Price is arguing that government is the creature of the people. Okay, this is revolutionary. Government is the creature of the, of the people. And Fletcher says, in full opposition to this doctrine, I assert that government is the creature of God. Okay. And then he, and he goes on and he says, uh, when God said, I will make man a help meet for him and joined Adam and Eve together in their human capacity, bidding them increase and multiply, he instituted marriage. And when he said to them in their regal capacity, have dominion, he delegated govern, governing a power and instituted government on earth. And he says, is not Dr. Price under a capital mistake when he makes government the creature of the people? Okay, so our whole experiment that we glory in, we glory in our representative government. We glory that we that power comes from the people. Authority comes from the people. And your representative is there to represent you. Well, where does God fit in? I thought he's supposed to represent God first. You know, I thought Notre Dame is God, country, Notre Dame. Well, where is God in our system? The, you know, if, I mean, the first sin was what? God spoke to Adam, here's what you do. Eve comes to Adam and says, Adam, no, here's what you do. And he goes, yeah, I think I'll go with my wife. Saul was put in. The people wanted a king. God gave it to him. And God had Saul taken down. He had actually had Saul killed. Why? Well, Saul, Saul knew why. He said, I feared the people, and I listened to the, them instead. Okay? So we have a, a government that totally says it's the voice of the people, and we spread this around the world. And what kind of chaos has this brought to the world? That's, that's my question. You know, has it brought peace or, you know... When God's will is being done, and when you're listening to God, you're going to have peace. Isn't that basically Catholic teaching? His will is our peace. Yeah. So it's right. great to listen to your wife, and it's great to listen to the voice of the people, but not when it overtakes God's, what God has said. Well, from my standpoint, you might recognize that there's something called secondary causes. So you could be honoring God primarily, recognizing that God himself allows people to form governments in different ways. And one of the possible ways is to have a, a representative government. That's just secondary cause. That's not the primary cause. God is the first cause. But secondary See, government, that, I mean, that's, representative government's fine, as long as they are always listening to God's voice. Right. But well, if representative government means, which it does in America, for every politician I've ever known, it means I'm to represent the voice of the people. That's what the politicians well, have always said. I'm have sorry, you ever heard Peter, one say, I represent the voice of God? Didn't John Adams say that this Constitution wasn't going to work except for a moral and religious people? I mean, I'm paraphrasing, you probably know the quote better than I do. But the issue being, 
that that the fo the founders certainly recognized that that this wasn't going to work unless the people were in order. Well, look, okay, Adam listened to the voice of Eve, and mm -hmm. boom, judgment hit the earth. Jud I mean, more judgment than has ever hit the earth, right? We all, we all have to die. The the curse was just tremendous for listening to Eve. Now, you got the four horsemen are bringing judgment. Well, isn't it the same principle? Instead of listening to God, we're listening to another voice, and the, therefore... The form of government doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. You know, it can be in a democracy, a republic, a military directorate. It doesn't matter. But if that the government... The basis of the policies has got to be good to God's law. If you don't follow God's law, then you have tyranny. And you also go against what God said you're supposed to do, and the church has always said you're supposed to do, which is to base all your public policies on God's law. Yeah, and when you purposely... And, and, so, and so, you know, representative government is a lie. It doesn't, it doesn't mean what it should. you got to base the policies on God's law. So the people who are in government are, are acting for the benefit of the people on behalf of God and um, doing what is right to build a virtuous society. Right, so the people have a duty to elect into office those who are skilled at what they used to call Christian politics. You have to put somebody in office that is skilled at implementing the law of God in a practical way. And if the voters don't put that type of person in, that voter is very evil, okay? He is, he is very evil because he's got a burden on him under representative government, because, you know, on paper, we say, Benjamin Franklin, they all said it, we're the, we're the, we're the authority. We created this government. But, but here, state, you know, church and state are separate. You cannot have moral policies uh, as the only reason for the laws. That's what the Supreme Court has said. In uh, Lawrence versus Texas? In Lawrence versus Texas. That's not the only reason that you can base your laws on. And, Ad and Jefferson said there's a separation of church and state. He knew that. They knew that from Virginia. Right. So this is the basis of the American experiment. So, yeah, it is. So that it, that so, is the heart of the American experiment. Right. Yeah. So, it, so it, it maybe for a while it didn't. It Up to the Civil War, in my mind, they were kind of like embarrassed if they passed a law that wasn't consistent with God's law. You, you still had a strong culture, but it was getting weaker because of the First Amendment. The principles in the First Amendment were filtering down into society at large. Right. So now... This then, then we look at NATO and we look at how we're engaging the world with this form of government because international law is big, right? And, and yeah. America and lawyers and the government, we play a big role in international law and we come in with the presupposition that authority comes from the people. Well, this is why America is a revolutionary construct and it goes around the world. Um, basically overthrowing societies and governments. It always has. It's been on the march since it was formed. It's right. been on the march for 400 years. And that's what Fletcher said. He said, if, if they succeed, they will overthrow all kings and all authority that's in right. the earth. Yeah, that's right. And, and <laughs> yeah, and right now we're in World War V, and so Russia and China is next. And when Russia and China go, then all the non-aligned nations will go with them. Right, and, and as far as the Notre Dame community in you know trying to participate in what's going on, Notre Dame draws on a Catholic tradition, which would also include the concept of a Catholic confessional state. Well, that's what Notre Dame should be teaching. That's part of that the, is the ideal. That's, that's the part of the tradition. Because right now you have no state religion. Could you explain that <clears throat> Catholic confessional state. Well, or detail. That's a good Dave one. is is strong yeah. on the Catholic confessional state. I'm strong on the Constitution should be, which they've attempted many times. It should be amended to acknowledge Jesus Christ, the, which then would implement the divine positive law. Right. The Catholic confessional state is is a state. That says the religion is established as the religion of the country, and and the church is established in law. How would that affect church. law, law generally? State by state? Well, right now, instead of the divine positive law, and if it was a Catholic confessional state, it would simply be the Catholic understanding of the divine positive law. That determines. That's a plumb line for the country. So, 
well, that law wouldn't be moral, so that law wouldn't be right. You can't pass that kind of law. It, 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 it rubs up against the divine positive law. Right, you're, what you're, we have right. now is you have all it takes is for rich people, the powerful people, to decide, well, I think we want to get a law passed for this. They can do it. Right, they can do it. But, but also, too, what, what happens when you establish the church, it's strong. It is strong, and I know some people will argue, and they'll say, well, it'll be corrupted. Yeah, sure, but it's not doing very good in this experiment. But once you establish it, it did pretty well in Spain, too. Um, once you establish it, then you protect it. The state has to protect it. And once it's established, then it puts real power, it puts a real torque, it puts a real check on the on the appetites of private parties in the private sphere. That's why they don't like established religions. And as you read the biographies of the founders, you see, yeah, they didn't like Catholicism, but they didn't like any religion being established. Because that, that would put a check on, at least for sure, on their commercial interest. It sure would. It would, it would check them. They would be checked by people that they don't know who march to a different drummer. So it's a commercial enterprise. Because if they wanted a state religion... They either pick the Catholic Spanish tradition or the the Church of England tradition or the Dutch tradition, if they were going to pick a model. Well, they had some practical concerns. Mm -hmm. But see, that's the brilliance of this whole thing. They understand how to use practical concerns to a long-term goal. And so um, what, what they knew is they needed to get everybody on board. So if they picked one religion to be the religion of the country, or they had religious tests, well, then the other religions may not like that. They may not join in the Constitution. And the most important thing they were trying to do in Philadelphia that summer of 1787 was to build a strong enough central government that would allow there to be a strong enough economy in this country, because they saw the commercial value of it. Now, that's, that's kind of the reality of what they went through. Um, and so there's no there's no church, uh, there's no state religion, uh, and that idea filtered down into the states and been applied to the states. But Catholics are supposed to change that. I don't think Catholics have ever dealt with a society where there's no established religion. It's either like some Protestant religion or Islam or Buddhism or something like that. Right. So then they got bewildered. Right. They came over. I, th I think a lot of them sold out. I think the Catholics sold out, beginning all the way back to the Carols. I think they did. So the uh, your contemporary culture is for meeting people's needs economically, and that's it. Basically, that's what the law is for, to to yeah. grease the rails for commerce and who's ever the most powerful, like Amazon. They don't pay taxes or well, well, the I, I, I think it, I think it's a very it's a very seductive. It's very subtle. It's very sophisticated. Yeah, it meets the needs of the people. But, but the entrepreneurs and, and the powerful private interests <clears throat> understand how to use that to their benefit. Uh, so, you know, the best way to control people is to give them what they want. That's mm -hmm. the best way to control mm -hmm. them. The, the best way to make money is to fulfill a need in people. And if you can encourage that need and then fulfill it, you know, then you're really doing great. You're really making a lot of money. And you're really controlling the situation. So when has America been a post-Christian culture? I'm sorry, what? Can you pin a year down where America is a post-Christian culture? Well, Gus was talking about that when Thomas Merton wrote his book in, what, 1960? 1962, he wrote uh, Peace in the Post-Christian World. 52. So, 62. 62. And, of course, uh, the, the term post-Christian, I believe, was first coined in the 50s by C.S. Lewis. And Merton borrowed it for the title of that book. In the art world, they call it post-modernism. Or post postmodernism. Well, yeah, I think that yeah, they, they overlap, post but it's it means something different. Postmodern means something different than post-Christian, doesn't it? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. It's but, a movement in the arts. But the yeah, but the point is, is that uh, uh, people in 1962 would have a hard time grasping that their country was post-Christian. If you think about what life was like. In 1962, now I was quite young. But well, that's when they did take prayer out of school. But, yeah. uh, but, 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 but in Wisconsin, they weren't praying much anyway. Okay, but they, people were going to church on Sunday, especially the black community. Well, in Appleton, the they, probably 80 percent of the people were going to church. Well, yeah, there's a there is a funny story about my experience. I I moved to South Bend, and <clears> I had these neighbors. I found out later they were atheists, but because they were 
playing music on Sunday morning, classical music, I presumed that they were Jewish. And a friend of mine laughed at me. and He said, Gus, what do you think this is, the 1950s? You presume that they're Jewish because they're not going to church and they're playing classical music. It turns out they were atheists. Uh, that's when I moved into the neighborhood in 1988. It, but he, I was laughed at because I was naive. But, I play classical music on Sundays. Well, okay, I, I, I'm not, and, and you're certainly not an atheist. Especially Baroque. No, you're Southern certainly Baroque. not an atheist. But what I'm getting at is that uh, uh, the, the post-Christian environment is already w with us. Yeah. And even Merton saw it in 62. So he realized that in order to dialogue with people, he had to recognize that as a fact, even though he was Christian. See? Or have they created substitutes for the traditional family? Have they blown it up and they have substitutes now for ersatz family values, hmm. new family values? And how does that tie in with the 60s, the moves towards civil rights, the riots, <sighs> uh, church prayer out of schools, no pledge of allegiance, abortion in 73? It's just pornography, legal. It just seems like a litany of uh, well, what, uh, of a c clashes against a uh, civil order. Well, civil when, morality. When, what Dabney saw with the Civil War, which Lord Acton called the Second French Revolution, he saw that the the, the new equal, the radical equality that the husband will have no more authority over the wife than the wife would over him. And there's absolutely the wife would, would not be legally bound to obey her husband. Okay, that's gone. Okay, that's absolutely what everybody that was an intellectual or spiritual in the South saw. That's what the North was bringing. And so when it's illegal to assume and act on it that you, have a, you, can, you can command your wife, even if you command her sweetly, gently, you are not allowed to assume you have more authority over her than she over you. You cannot command that home. Okay, the effect of that, okay, is going to be tremendous. Okay, it's going to destroy everything in its path. That's what that's what Dabney said. That's what the Southerners said, and and we believe in it. We believe that that's how it should be. Our legal system believes that the husband should not have more authority over the wife than she over him. We believe that. That's our belief, and you're not going to change people on that. Okay, so. And now you believe it, we believe in spreading it to the world. Okay, that's where Europe is at. What, what, well, what? Europe has been de-Christianized. No one's going to church over there in those great cathedrals. And the, the Muslims are growing well, the whole, the exponentially. Whole, to have the home, well, nothing wrong with that, but that's, they've given it up, that identity. The, the home identity. is the church, okay, right? What, what are the, 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 the... The domestic church, they call it, right? Yeah, the home is the domestic church. And so if the father is not... I thought the home was the parish, in mm -mm. the community of the believers. Mm. The parish the is mostly parish. considered a family of families. Right. Okay, but the family is the basic... Sell. It's a building block of the culture in Japan, right. Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Morocco, right, Africa. Family is revered. Elders are revered. Babies are revered. They're gifts from God. But all the, around the world, except where? Where is abortion up till nine months? The United States, which the same laws in North Korea, in China. So in Europe, it's not. Even, well, what I'm saying is the value of life has diminished with the loss of the Christian value system. But, 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 the, but the Puritans... Except in the, uh, these other cultures that they will not brook anybody touching their family value systems, their terms of masculinity, femininity, sharply defined. But the, fa the, family, the, the family depends on that father maintaining honor, okay? He has to be honored. And he has to do his he has to do his duty, which is fundamentally first the family altar. 
he has to set that home up as a church, that he's the prophet, priest, and king. And he has the family altar. He brings them around. He has the prayers. He has the Bible reading. If you're Catholic, you have just a little bit maybe different type of family altar, but it's the same concept. But, but, but the governments of the West don't hold that anymore. That's what I think you know, that's what Chris is, Chris is saying. They don't hold to that vision anymore. Now, does the Catholic Church hold to that vision yeah, anymore? Yeah, what's, what's the Catholic I, I Church's mean, opinion on this? Because to the degree you that they went to the reunion and you right. saw the, the Archbishop of Ukraine give a talk? Yes, and I'd like to oh, yeah, comment on yeah, that. Yeah, that was at the graduation, right? Right, at I wasn't at the grad. I wasn't I, at the that's what I meant. The commencement, commencement on May fifteenth, but I was just recently finished up, uh, like a class reunion, and it was a very moving, nostalgic experience. Also pointing to the future, and um, I guess well, let's bring it back to Notre Dame here, and we can bring it back. We've talked about families and family values that are very strong in the Orthodox world, Russia and Ukraine, and all these places, but they're crumbling in the U.S. And it's kind of like there's a, there's a charade going on where they're substituting this other air stats forms. But I want to get to Notre Dame, and I did analyze the mm -hmm. speech. I listened to it on the YouTube, and the Archbishop. Uh, this isn't really personal about the Archbishop. He's a lovely man. He's a man of God, and he's, his parents were Catholic, and they grew up in that area, so he's, he's loyal Mm -hmm. to his sense of Ukraine, and he was probably damaged by Stalin in the World War, in the communist, okay, after World War II, and even the German attack. So, but when I analyze it, okay, his platform was Notre Dame graduates, mm -hmm. all class, you know, and this is a big thing to be coming there to give a speech. Now, and why do you think Notre Dame invited him to speak? I think they did it because they were told to do it, because Notre Dame chose him at that moment when the war is being lost and like my prediction was when you can't win a war you don't fight a war like if Mexico attacked us it's gonna be over I don't know one month two months three. so I knew right away it's it's a losing cause right okay to force that issue to happen versus peaceful negotiations and deal making so he comes in and he gives a speech that's a pep rally speech for the heroic underdogs, you know, fighting the Orthodox Russians, and if you analyze the speech, it's based on a lot of uh, a lot of false premises. Um, it's a false paradigm because he doesn't mention that Ukraine since 215 has been a one-party state only under Zelensky. No opposition figures; they've been arrested. Their TV, their newspapers are all shut down since 214. The SBU, which is their C, uh, FBI, Wait, rounds up everybody you, that you disagrees. No opposition There's no opposition have been, to him. Have, have been arrested. There are no opposition because they've all been arrested. Yeah, and okay. so he made a deal with the Azovs because they're very powerful. And he said, okay, guys, I'll integrate you into the military and I'll give you power. You give me power. And let's go uh, get, let's go fight in the Donbass from 14 to 22. Can you just briefly the, explain the bishop, how he got into office? How did he get in? Through TV, and he got 70, uh, because they were disappointed. They were, uh, Ukraine was sick of their oligarchs. This guy came with a TV show saying that he was a president, uh, running for the presidency, like a Donald Trump type show, real TV. <clears throat> and, and, and he voted him in because they wanted some weird guy to come in and be their president and he promised peace he promised everything you know like the pie in the sky but when he gets in he hardens down they go and attack the Donbass in 214 15 they get they have two offenses that get turned back by the Russians in May and June and then in August so what they do is they build a static defense in depth which the Russians are in the process of de demilitarizing totally destroying it by by foot, by foot, by yard, by bunker, by trench. They're just pushing all the way through. They built that for eight years. So they built this intricate World War I type of siege mentality. Um, so he's not mentioning that the Azovs are Nazis related to the Stefan Badera Nazi movement who uh, allied with the Nazis, who killed many Poles, Ukraines, Russians, Jews, uh, Romanis. Okay, he doesn't mention that. Okay, he doesn't mention the Nazis in the Mariupol. He talks about the city of Mary, Mariupol. Everybody in Mariupol that was liberated said, the Azov Brigade comes in our apartments, shoots missiles out, and then runs, and then the Russians 
strike in the area and it hits, they're hitting infrastructure, apartments, because they're parking their tanks and rockets and they're firing them off and they're moving them. Until the Russians figured that out, they realized, well, don't fire back right away. You know, let's look around. So basically, they were using the people as human shields, okay, constantly through that entire three-month program where they kept a prisoner on the ground and they wouldn't let him escape. So he doesn't mention that. So, that so that's, a, so, that's a war crime. Yeah, well, that's a serious war crime. That's a serious war crime. Okay, well, he doesn't well, mention it. Stepan Bandera and his people, those guys actually were in the West German government after the war, weren't they? That's a little strange. And their descendants are in all over the world because the woman who works for Trudeau, his uh, banking minister, Christina Freeland, her, oh, right. her grandfather was a Nazi who worked on newspapers in Poland and in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so does it mention that? No. Okay, so he says Russia's the Goliath. No, I think Russia is David. They're fighting, they're fighting through Ukraine. They're fighting the United States full armed forces, surveillance drone satellites. Uh, they're fighting all their weapons. They're fighting NATO. They're fighting the United Kingdom. They're fighting 29 European countries. They're fighting economic hardships, like they've stopped. The, they've stopped SWIFT. They've they've boy, they've had sanctions on since Trump was president. They've tried to cripple their economy since 2014, 216. That's eight, ten years. They've been under economic siege, which which forced Japan to come to war against us. We stopped oil supplies and we stopped. Uh, metal shipments, uh, scrap metal, and we once we stopped that, then within a year, Japan uh, attacked us and, and, and declared war on us. So he gives off this litany of it's like a heroic struggle, but he's he, not giving he, all the facts. He's not giving the facts, and if he if he was such a if he was the man he should be, he would have told Zelensky to make a deal with Russia, give him the Donbass, give him that place. And forget the Crimea. Well, that's it's been part of Russia. Said. Make a deal. Move on. Don't antagonize them. And that's what you said. Kissinger said. And, that? And yeah. Kissinger said the yeah. Ukrainians need to give land to Ukraine, and and Kissinger for was security. immediately attacked by Zelensky. Well, even yeah. Chomsky, even Chomsky was uh, right. taking that kind of position too. Yeah, Chomsky took the same. Chomsky it was kind did. of amazing to right. see. Ch Chomsky the, took took the Kissinger position. Right. It right. was amazing right. to see because Noam Chomsky and and Henry Kissinger it, take the same position. Know, that know that know doesn't happen that often. Because, often. Often. because no. it's a real politic. It's pragmatic. It's horse mm -hmm. trading. Yes, it's, it's reality. Real it's the he adults in the room. Yeah, right. adults in the room. So so he comes and gives that speech was basically useless. It was a useless speech. That he gave, I love the man. He's a blessed man. He's an archbishop, and I pray for him. But he could have called, used that speech, and said, "War is war. We helped start the war. We didn't know what we were doing. We've got Nazis in our country. They're killing civilians. They're using them as shields. This is unacceptable. These are war crimes in my country. I want to see it stop now." He could have come out against his excesses and the Russians and said, I want them to come together today. Well, no, what did he say? Pep rally, more death, more bombing, more fighting, more So this attrition. is a preeminent Catholic university, and he's given a pep rally, is what you're saying. He's a pep rally for more war. On board. He wants more people, he wants more Ukrainians to die, more buildings to be blown up, more train stations to be hit. He, he's, he's, he's basically giving the NATO line of let's bleed Russia, let's prolong, prolong, like Afghanistan. Turn it into their little Afghans. But it's not going to happen. So I'm just saying, he had a moment. He had the audience. He, he, I'm not, this is not against him personally. Uh, he, he likes and loves America. He loves sports and culture. He talked about sports culture, and that's Notre Dame. But, like, it was just a waste of time. And he had a great forum. And so I'm starting to think it was a very shallow speech. And it was basically almost something you'd read off Facebook. It's something just, I think it was shallow. So, which gets me to thinking as I'm walking across campus, I see no, Father Hesburgh's International Center. I'm thinking, uh, who runs that? Who speaks for that? Like, why haven't they come up with a white paper about getting peace? Because Hesburgh worked with the Russians to de-arm and de-escalate nuclear weapons. And now we've got the four horsemen released saying this guy is the top, one well, of the top leaders, ex-prime minister, and he's security man, saying we're ready to unleash. 
we're like, uh, you know, on a hair's trigger, and everybody's running around like it doesn't exist because the media won't address the subject. The media yeah, the, is the, lying yeah, to everyone. Now, so. Yeah, this really disturbs me. Because what I, what I, my sense is, is that nobody's thinking realistically, except Kissinger, Chomsky, a few people Mayor in Shimer. the, in the uh, Mayor Scheimer, a Stephen, few people. Stephen in, Cohen, when he was alive. When, when Stephen Cohen was alive, he was saying similar things mm -hmm. to Mayor Scheimer. But uh, the issue is that nobody wants to look at the danger of all this. And, and it, this was relatively easy to have negotiated it and to avoided war. Why didn't anybody address that? And, well, and then even mm -hmm. now, why didn't anybody ask the question about the uh, previous causes? Right. I mean, for most Americans, most of my friends who are, who are uh, got, some of them who have Ukrainian flags now on their Facebook um, uh, thing, um, and some of them are taking them down. Well, I you know, I don't know, but the, but in this case, <laughs> I saw one guy taking it down. Well, okay. Well, if you okay. go, if you go back point, to the Minsk Accords, right? Where, where okay. Germany, France, Ukraine, and Russia, in two four fifteen, they went to Munich mm -hmm. again. Maybe they sat down at the peace table. They signed the papers that they were going to start this process of. Mm -hmm. uh, Demilitarizing the Donbass in the Luhansk people's area, they call them. Okay, so he, Zelensky signed his name to that paper. As soon as he left that meeting and went home, he just said, I'm not doing any of that. And he never implemented one iota. And he restarted the war. Well, yeah, the war continued, and 20,000 civilians are died. The major U.S. media, except for alternative media like Mint Press and there were a lot of reporters that covered that Donbass. Patrick Lancaster, mm -hmm. he spent time there. Mm -hmm. And so there was plenty of information out there if you looked for it. But you never saw anything in the New York Times about that frozen conflict in the Donbass where 20,000 civilians were killed. Right. From 14 to 22. No, that, see, before this second yeah, the, the UN military UN operation. 50, total so counts. Russia did not trust Zelensky because they already went and made one deal with them. They sold him a car and he wouldn't make the payments. So they repossessed the car. <laughs> they took it back. So they're tired of they're tired of being dealing with double faced liars. They did they wanted Ukraine problem to be solved. Well I I'd they like to say they want to do business with the world. That's well, period, I, so. I, I you know, I think Ukraine has become like a you know, a a, a Western puppet, you know, to yeah. attack Russia in a lot of people's minds. And the church is just not there to broker peace. They're just, right. they're just not there. They've taken sides. Francis has taken sides, and then he kind of changes his mind, and then he comes back. He said that maybe Russia was pushed into the war. By NATO. That's yeah, by what he NATO, said. But he doesn't really come out and stand on that. So you're right. The Catholic Church has thrown in, and I think they what? decided to pull him in here for the speech because it was their rally with, with uh, sympathy with Ukraine. And that's fine and good, you know, but uh, I didn't see rallies for the Vietnamese people during the Vietnam War where they had somebody come in from Vietnam and try to stop the war because of all the civilian the civilian casualties. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They could have backed the NLF or the South. They, they, they were AWOL in the Vietnam War, but I think, I mean, students, it was the lively topic. Everybody was in on that topic. Everybody had a draft card. Everybody was had people there. People they knew died. People. So, but what well, I'm saying well, is, the, the church elites, is abrogating, abrogating want. its main the what function. Well, no, I, the, I, the elites didn't like Vietnam. They wanted to divide the country, but they they want this war. They want this war, but now they're not wanting it so much. If you pick up the if you pick up, you listen to the Duran, you listen to other people. They're trying to slowly disengage from it. But because the, Kissinger has a lot of power, and his, I think his ideology is starting to. But the, the problem is push into for 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 us being part of the Notre Dame, you know, community. Yeah, is that it, it, it appears Dame. like they're using Notre Dame. They're using yeah. the image of a premier Catholic university right. to kind of make, give the impression that that justice and righteousness is on the side of the Ukraines more. To fight. Yeah. That's not that's not a fair approach to peace. 
That's yeah. where the big mistake is. Uh, I, you know, I think that they have they have to see both. If if Notre Dame can't see both sides, it can't talk to the Orthodox Church. And then get, who can? And get a right. get an Orthodox Metropolitan from Chicago, from New York. Get to New York, the number one. Bring them in here and have a long discussion with Father Jenkins and his trustees. Yeah, they should. And be. make a plan and say, look, how do we stop this, guys? Instead of promoting it, how do we stop it? It's cold. That's where they should be doing it. That's what Hesburg would have been doing. That would be a more balanced. That's what Hesburg would have done. He went to Russia, didn't he? Yeah, no. He Hesburg, solved the missile problems. I know he did. Now, why do they have an institution named at him that's not doing anything? You have, just what are they doing? Simple marriage no, counseling. What are they doing? I, do, look, look. A friend of mine. Up. A friend of mine <laughs> said to me, he, when I was pushing certain issues. So, so you know, guys, I somebody just looked at me cynically and said, Gus. Hesburgh and John Dunn are dead. And, Face it. And they ain't coming back. And they ain't coming back. That was the thing. But for me, Hesburgh and John Dunn represented a whole nother angle on this peace issue. There's no doubt about it. Don't you think that's the biggest issue in the world right now? Oh, I think so. And I, I think everywhere. I no, All I over think the world. No, I think there's such a danger here. And I've been I, I've been I've been writing on Facebook and I, I'm participating in this discussion because I think the model needs to be what John the 23rd did. Amen. With Kennedy and Khrushchev, Khrushchev. and worked it all out. Those senators, all those great those people were we had. there were, a, I guess, Republicans could, and Democrats. Yeah, we need to pray that the church can rise to the occasion. And one of the things we can do is articulate what we think the church should do. And I would say we pray that the church take a role of peace building like John the 23rd did. Okay. Do you, but don't you believe since we're Catholics here, right? And we're at Notre Dame and we're affiliated and we, uh, we love the institution, mm -hmm. respect it that we need to call on them to lead a return, a repentance to traditional values of peace and reconciliation through the Arab world, all over the world, wherever the, the strife is, wherever the conflicts are, and, and get on center stage and get the message out. It's got to be, the Catholics need to repent first in the Catholic Church because maybe they've been dismissive of all these things that are just piling up on top of everybody, and they don't know what to do, maybe, or they don't they have feel, the leadership. Yeah, I think people are pretty well frozen. Okay, so how do we break out of the frozen? It has to be, you have to repent. Where's the humility? Where's the enlightenment? Where, you know, the enlightenment can come in after you repent and say, look, this guys, isn't guys, working. Dave, where's, where's your practical I got a radical thing to say. I think, I think it'll work. The leadership. Right. What? You got to change the leadership of the church. You just got to change it. From the, get changed. from the Pope? From the Pope, Pope the, the Cardinals, bishops. most of them just got to go. They're poisoned with this idea um, you mean of, of Americanism. Americanism. Of Americanism. Yeah, Ameri and if you buy into Americanism, you follow the plococracy. Right. Part of the Americanism so that's why is what I was touching on is that the government is the creature. The government of, does of, no of, wrong. Of the people. <laughs> right. And, and that's where you get the Catholic confessional state. Well, no, well, you well, have to get the order back. Yeah, well, Americanism says, too, it's like, you know, well, America knows best. And so that's the civil society just kind of figuring things out and just saying, oh, yeah, that's the best way to do it. Well, the problem with that, that's all manipulated. That's all manipulated. That's we know that. That's the Reese Commission. That's everything I did. That's what other people have done. All that stuff is manipulated. Everybody knows that. If you've been living here in the last four or five years between... Um, certain events that have happened in a large North American country, uh, you will see that there's a, an enormous amount of manipulation going on of what Social. goes on. Of what, mind what, control. Mind, mind control. control. Mind, thank you. Right. Mind control. Well, we call that mass, um, mass formation psychosis. And don't you think the church has been captured? In, in the churches I've been captured during the certain problems we've been going through? where they stopped services in person, and they were told, you know, watch it on video. Well, no remote. And well yeah. They're losing their potency, their power. Well, that's not the root of the problem. Maybe they're losing but their I, faith. Maybe they've lost faith. Oh, I think a lot of them have Maybe they faith. don't have any more faith. I think okay. a lot of the leadership maybe has lost Maybe they're Maybe faith. they're done for. 
Well, maybe they, they don't want to say it. Okay, maybe it's time to clean guys, house. Guys, guys, this is it's time to clean house. Okay. They're still holding. Today's the birth of the church, and we're saying the salt lost its savior. I want yeah. someone that I, can call Putin up right now and this say, "This is Pentecost." Sunday. I want, I, is, I want a, somebody look. to call Putin right now, a Catholic pope or cardinal, uh, or no, I, Jenkins, and I, say, I, "What can we do to stop this? How do we?" Tell I us what we, to do. I, well, I want to have those called. Let's get this done. What are we waiting on? Okay. Armageddon? No, I don't want Armageddon. Well, let's get That's why I'm up here. Okay. But you can survive nuclear let's light a fire. No, but I don't want that. That's We're going to have to fire up our leadership because they're asleep at the wheel. Well, and and so how do you do that? I mean, I remember the story about Roosevelt when somebody came to him with an agenda that they wanted to change and he said, "You don't understand how this works." You have to go tell the people and, and take it to the people and have the people pressure me. There's truth to that. Yeah, but that's all on, the, on this ex radical notion that government was created by us. We created the well, government. Well, what I'm saying is God is, is no place in it. It has no place in our a, Constitution. Yeah, not only God, but God's Ten Commandments, the morality. It's illegal. Shall, Ten Commandments kill, are steal, illegal. Steal, kill, yeah, covet. I, uh, uh, all the lying, 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 so media without, lying. Without, without, bringing, okay. without bringing God back in in a practical way. Okay. Well, you can say e either, God. Either you have, well, Peter, most people. Peter, you could say God, but what's God's program? No, it's I, the Ten Commandments to the look, love, look, love God, look, Peter, love your neighbor. We live in South Bend. Okay, and we get that a, back. Listen, Peter and, and other horsemen with me here. Um, we do have a tradition here in South Bend. There's a statue of Father Hesburgh standing arm in arm with Martin Luther King. Now, there's there's lots of things you could say about both those men, but both those men were looking for a way for religion to address the public square in yes, America. Yes, you put it perfectly I, yeah, well. Okay. That's where I want to disagree with you. Well. That's where I want to disagree with yeah, you. I have to Gus, agree with him. When they put I that statue in, so. well, Hesburgh was working for the foundations. He was working for the plutocracy. No, he was trying to get a place at the table for Catholic. Catholics. Yes. That's different than working You're still for fighting them. against that, the That's lost. what Catholics have been saying for 250 years in this country. We want a place at the table. Well, in order to get at the table, you gotta, you got to leave your religion over here. Well, that's a debate. That, that's where we definitely disagree. Okay. But I don't think I, Hesburgh I, I, left his religion well, over there. No, no, we no. do disagree. And, I, and that's the, yeah. the, uh, I want to carry on a dialogue that's not too personal because maybe, after all, Father Hesburgh wrote the foreword to my book. Maybe he you was well, Gus, more so, clever so, than so, we know. I think you've got to be. Uh, <laughs> Let me just add so, in. I was there when they inaugurated that statue because I okay. was with the Martin Luther King Club, okay. and most of the club didn't want to go because they did feel like <laughs> Dave. It was just this globalist, you know, thing. And I went with another guy um, <clears throat> that knows you know, George yet knows him really well. Okay, and he. We just went just to be curious, okay? Mm -hmm. But it, it, you had the globalist people there. It was a globalist thing. The limousines, thing. right? That's what it was. All the limousines how, with however, the windows however, and the we, secret service. That doesn't mean we still can't use the ideal of what they represent, right? There you go. Okay. Yeah, Peter, you that, that's that's what, Peter, Peter, you, you finally said something. the public <laughs> sphere in America, you want to bring religion to the public sphere? Then preach the gospel. Treat, preach the Catholic preach the faith gospel. uncompromisingly. Preach the you want to do that? And then you're going to be martyred for it. And you will bear witness by your martyrdom. And I want to tell you something else. You're the guys at the top of the system, you know what they really hate? Martyrs. They hate martyrs. They hate when the blood they flows. They hate martyrs. Okay. They well, hate martyrs. Because they become and, heroes. And they, they hated the suicide bombers in Afghanistan. They hated these guys. Well, no, 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 please. Suicide bombers are let's, different let's than martyrs. Drop well, that. there's there is some similarity. No, they call them but martyrs. But I'm saying when you there. get martyred and they you do. get and you suffer for something, you bear witness for it. That's the only way you're going to bring it to the public sphere. You got to convert these people. But but if you don't convert them, they got to be reconverted. I mean, yeah. America is kind of a dried is, out. That huh? is Americanism. Americanism says, okay, we're going to keep this part and highlight this part. So it's more appealable to people. That that is the textbook definition. What about in the Test history? Since you're Valencia. an expert on American uh, culture, Amer yeah, Testament Bed of Valencia. No, say, no, say, okay, say that again. Say that again. I want to hear well, that again. Some, some part. Okay. Can I? Take I want to. I just, yeah. Uh, I just want to say. Go ahead. Since you're an expert in American history studies, you too. 
America comes up with waves of reformation. And you may not like them, but when a country seems like everything, like there's signs in the heavens, there's problems, there's Armageddon on the horizon, there's a civil war brewing, people start praying. They used to start praying, and then they would movements would break out all across the country. Right. And they would call that, what do they call that, the Great? The Great Awakening? Well, yeah, it's happened minute. numerous times. I, I have a when the country's question in with trouble. Yeah, yeah. I got a question with the Great Awakening. Well, the, well the, the, the Great Awakening was the spiritualist thing that came from within. It's a feeling. It's a vital eminence. 1740s. Modernism. But this it's is, defined is, American history and culture. I, I, I agree. And, and an important part of the right. way it defined that culture and history was it destroyed the established or weakened the established we churches. And made religion more individualistic, right. but America. An but but your no, point that America has an that. ability to like correct itself somewhat. Yeah, self-correcting. It, it, self it has a lot of. You're right. It has a lot of shock absorbers in right. there mm -hmm. to keep the different interests in the experiment. I'll right. say that. Right. When somebody gets okay, out but, of cattywampus, but, but, yeah, it straightens I, it out. I, I I I do want to claim that there are moments in history where 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 people can actually see God's hand. And I don't, I'm not talking about a naive kind of way, but like, um, like this, this, it is really true, Dave. I want to propose something about modernism and Americanism using the image of what happened during the Petrogal Fire. Now, the Petrogal Fire occurred the same year as the Great Chicago Fire. In Wisconsin, right? But it was 10 times bigger. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, uh, and, Spill that for the people so they can look it up. Yeah, you uh, Petrigo. No. P E S H T I G O. Yeah. Petrigo fire. We grew up. If you're in Wisconsin, you grew up with the Petrigo fire. You grew up that was hearing huge. about it and all that. But one I of the things. You said PepsiCo. <laughs> no, no Pepsico. not PepsiCo. Petrigo, please. Petrigo. It's oh, a, an Indian. It's was, a, would it's you a call that Native a, American name? Would you right. call that a judgment of God to have that? Well. No, um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. What what I think? No, but there was a shrine that was established uh, way before, like 1859, by a immigrant girl from Belgium uh, who wanted to be a nun, but her spiritual director in Belgium said, "No, you got to go with your parents to the New World and help them get established as farmers." Mm -hmm. So she obeyed her spiritual director, but she still wanted to preach the gospel. She still, so what she did is she went from farm to farm, cleaning house and preaching the catechism to the children. Mm. I'll clean your house in, and uh, help you around your house if you allow me to teach your children to pray. And then she was out in the, mm. in the area there and she encountered the Blessed Virgin. And this is the typical Belgian. Uh, you know, I've been working in a Belgian parish for 31 years, St. Babel's, and it's a funny story from my standpoint. She encounters the Blessed Virgin. She runs back to her parents. She's scared. And they say to her, go back to where you encountered that person. It might be a poor soul that needs your prayers. Classic uh, underestimation on these on the part of these wonderful Pragmatic. people. <laughs> Pragmatic. But she does go back and she speaks the word to Adele Bryce, teach the children to pray. And Adele Bryce establishes this shrine and, and a school to teach kids, orphans, and so on. And it goes through a lot of things. But the Petrigal Fire comes through in 1871. And this is the tragic story. The people around, some of them dove into their wells when mm. the fire was coming, and others of them ran to the shrine and stayed in the shrine, and the fires came right up to the edge of the shrine, but they didn't cover the, the shrine. The house forced to death. I don't know. And it was that. absolutely like a miracle, yeah, and they yeah. celebrated it every August 15th and after that. Except in the 1890s, they, the bishop had to stop it because people were drinking too much at the celebration. A typical Wisconsin, Wisconsin problem. problem. But then they, they resumed it. They still do it now. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting to me, it's an image of the problem of modernism and Americanism. And it's really sad. The, and I'm not blaming the people who went through this physically for, 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 for that, but it's an image. When you're confronted with a problem, you have a choice sometimes between 
going to the church, your, the, the people of God, your community, or that, or diving into yourself, diving into your own imminence, like modernism, one of the big things they condemned about modernism was this diving into imminence. By the in, imminence, yeah. Right, right? Yeah. And, and, so, and so the thing is, is that what I see is that, is that in this crisis, we need to turn to each other mm -hmm. and turn to the church and not dive into our own uh, uh, wells. Our, our own wells. Our own wells aren't going to save us. Right. What's going to save us, in my view, is the common good, the, the uh, common good of the church. And, and indeed, you realize that when we talk about the common good, if you look at Maritan, yes, the common good, that. the common yeah. good, for merit, the uncreated common good is the Trinity. Okay. The Trinity. Wow. Right. So the thing is, is that is that there's a, analogous gradations. Okay. So you got the common good of the family, the common good of the of the clan, the common good of the village, the common good of the city, the common good of the county, the common good of the state. Mm -hmm. Right. But but the common good can go all the way to the Trinity. Interestingly enough, by analogy. So, 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 no, no, I, I, you know, and I, I realize that there's some weaknesses to that position. The key weakness being that it's not just analogy that helps us here. Analogy can point, point out things, but it's presence. It's this, it's this, it's this sense of a, a real relationship with God and with God's people that manifests itself in presence. Okay. That's that's John Dunn. No, we got uh, only. Uh, I know. Three minutes. Three left. minutes. I'm sorry. I. Oh, well, no, I'll Dave was saying you were, you were. No, I, I just test and benevolent. Like uh, no, so explain so that again. Up. Explain well, it. It's basically if you try to lessen some doctrine and build up others, that's Americanism. To get converts or to achieve something, that's that's Americanism. Anyway, go ahead. That's what Americanism. Wrap it that's up. American. Wrap it up. Wrap it up. That's that's wrap it up. I'll have to say what we're we we're, we're this this program was is a lot of great. Uh, anecdotes, but wouldn't you say we're calling out to Notre Dame in love, but also asking for uh, a response as far as leader take take more active leadership in a non in in a more uh, even-handed way, because like I have a big heart for Syria in the Syriac Church, which is Orthodox, but there's also those like original church in Aramaic. Right. Okay, and there's a church of Syrians in Jacksonville that I've been to, and it's the same ceremony closely after Jesus. So those were the churches of Alex. I never heard any Catholics cry out f to help the Syrians, and I thought, why? They're the, they're the original Christians. They're the original Catholics. It's the original church, and they're just dead silent. It's almost like they've been lobotomized to the suffering of other Christians in the Middle East. It was any all over. And I'm just saying, because I'm interested in that area, I'm wondering where's the disconnect between the Vatican and these Catholic institutions where that's not even talked about, I mean, not like even the, written the about. The Asperger Peace Institute could be addressing this. Yeah, they could, they could have put a lot right. of Is focus on well, Syria. I don't know enough about what they're doing right now to speak intelligently about it. But We're just I, I think in a, in a general sort of way, the reason we're gathering here as the four horsemen is to raise the uh, the trumpet and say, yes. "Please wake up, people, before it's too late." I mean, that's how I feel. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, our Resurrect choice is faith. our choice is is to build bunkers. Okay, because you can survive. Well, what's the a answer, you, Peter? You can survive a nuclear what war. What is the answer? Well, the bunker is the like bunker Noah's Ark. Matter. The bunker is Christ. You first there come you into go. Christ. And you find your, your turn, save your soul. Seek God. But then there's yeah. but then there, there is go. practical elements. If you're the father of the home, Peter, you have to protect your family. Peter, seek the Lord first. All things will follow, right? Your bunker won't protect you. It's a well. You dive to the well, you're gonna No, no, like you, you seek said. the Lord first. You have to save Amen. your soul. And then there's practical things you can do. But you first, save your soul, first we'll things save the other soul. First things first. As many souls as possible. Okay, so we're we're uh, calling ourselves the, the four horsemen. Are we all uh, content with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we'll be back. I and hope. then we can elaborate on what that means. Okay. Sure. We can elaborate on what it means, but definitely out of Revelation six, 
and it's a judgment, and unless we repent, we've, we're going to get the judgment. Yeah, right. I think that's we're right. We're trying to right. forestall the judgment. We want Christ. to right. forestall the judgment with right. repentance. Yeah. And yeah. repentance is a gift from God. Yeah. Right. Okay, we're wrapping it up, and so this is uh, Dave, Chris, Gus, and Peter.